Good evening. I am Josh Brumberg, the interim president here at the Graduate Center. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for our spring City of Science event, Birds, A Day in the Life. As a public university, the Graduate Center and its associated Advanced Science Research Center are committed to the idea that our scholarship has a role in advancing the public good. Before touching on tonight's event, as many of you know, we are a national leader in graduate education at the master's and especially the doctoral levels. It, we are the home of innovative research and creative works of Nobel, Guggenheim, and Pulitzer Prize winners. We are one of the largest PhD granting institutions in the country, and we are especially proud to rank among the country's top 10 institutions in awarding doctorates to students from underrepresented groups. I am confident in saying that no other graduate school in the country takes more seriously its public responsibilities or its mission to advance knowledge for the public good. We are not only a place dedicated to advanced education and research, it is also a laboratory of idea which delivers the finest research and scholarship to and far beyond the five boroughs. Each year, our doctoral students teach more than 130,000 undergraduates at the City University of New York, bringing the very best research and learning from the seminar room into the classroom. I hope that you will make a habit of attending our public programs, lectures, and events so you can truly be part of the City of Science. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists. First to my far left is Professor Ori Schaefer, who is a member of the Neuroscience Initiative at the Advanced Science Research Center and a member of our biology PhD program, and a chronobiologist, and you'll learn what that is by the end of the night, whose research utilizes the fruit fly to study circadian rhythms. And I am joined in the middle by Dr. Mark Hauber, who is the executive director of the Advanced Science Research Center and an expert on parasitology in birds and the author of the recently released Bird Day, which we are celebrating tonight. Uh, before we start, a few ground rules. I will lead, be leading our panel and discussion for the first part of tonight's program, and then towards the end, I will open it up to questions for, from you, the audience. And please, when you do ask a question, wait until you're holding the microphone and speak into the microphone so our audience on Zoom can hear your questions as well. All right. Starting it off. All right. Mark, what made you decide to write a book? Uh, that's a great question. I wrote a book about 10 years ago called The Book of uh, Eggs. And uh, it was, you know, a crazy experience. Um, I spent six months uh, at my really pretty table that was made out of uh, pieces of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, writing 14, no, 140,000 words. And so, you know, 10 years later, you sort of have the bug in you and say like, oh, I should write another book. And uh, this time, you know, I wrote a little book. Um, but, uh, but it was, you know, the idea that I, I really wanted to write about, what do birds do all day long? And uh, the same press, University of Chicago Press, was, was willing to take a, um, um, you know, a bet on it. And, um, and so today, there's a book. So about, do you have an estimate about how many birds there are in the world? 10,000. 10,000. And so how did you choose the 24 that uh, are included in this book? So um, I chose birds that I care about. I chose birds that I wanted to learn more about. And I chose birds that my friends studied. Um, so I wanted to make sure that the book is based on primary research, articles, peer-reviewed articles that people have published on them or things that I could read, um, you know, but it also includes birds that I, you know, really wanted to uh, um, highlight. So my study species, American robin, brown-headed cowbird, common cuckoo are in the book. And then, you know, my friends' uh, study species like the, um, the cook's petrel or uh, the kakapo are also in the book. All right, and I think we're gonna show a few pictures if we could get the slides. And I know these are some of your favorite birds. So we're gonna walk through these and you know, kind of tell us what uh, made you choose them and what, what kind of why they do what they do during what time of day. Very good. So the barn owl is uh, a wonderful uh, species because it occurs on most continents. Uh, 
Uh, the one that it doesn't really occur on uh, has about um, um, 12 different species of barn owl looking things, uh, Australia. And so um, it's also a great study system for neuroethologists. So barn owls um, have a hearing system that's really well studied. Uh, I once met somebody who said I did my PhD on a one and a half owl. And I didn't want to know what the half owl meant, uh, uh, but I, I know, you know, he was a neurophysiologist and, uh, and he was studying, um, you know, um, um, uh, that bird for a while. Um, but barn owls are not only uh, 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 charismatic, um, they're also commensals of humans. Uh, they live in, uh, in buildings, uh, they live in towers, they live in uh, abandoned attics and uh, they come in two different color morphs. And so, you know, whether it's color, whether it's behavior, whether it's hearing, whether it's the, the nocturnal behaviors, uh, um, they, they really represent something that's worth writing about. So how, how and uh, these birds would probably start being active about right now, yeah. searching for their, their food. How does it know the time of day? Ori, do you want to take a guess at you that? Want me to take that? Sure. Um, well, as it turns out, um, every animal on the planet has a clock in its brain, a very small region of the brain that is a, an exquisitely timed, highly accurate clock. And so it's hard to imagine why an animal would need this. We essentially live on a clock. It rotates once a day instead of twice a day like ours. Uh, but as it turns out, um, animals uh, display really striking uh, behavioral changes, physiological changes throughout the day. And that does not require any information from the environment. There is a, a, an extremely uh, well-designed clock in the brain that will uh, tell this owl it's time to go hunting, um, whether it knows what time it is outside or not. All right. And I think we have the next bird. Very good. So um, when I was in Germany during COVID, um, I was living in you know, at uh, Urbana-Champaign in Illinois, which if you've been, it's not like New York City. Um, it's really boring. And, uh, and so I got some fellowships to move to Germany. Um, and instead of taking the best one, I sort of took them in sequence. Uh, so I ended up living in Germany for two years. And one time, it was January, and I was, you know, it was like 7 o'clock in the morning, pitch dark in Bremen. Uh, and uh, um, there was, a, there was a, a, a European robin singing, um, you know, right over uh, the streetlight that was still illuminated because, you know, in Bremen at 7 o'clock in the morning in January, it's still dark. And, uh, and so it, it really caught me because, you know, we know that robins sing at night, uh, you know, in urban places, we know nightingales do it on their own. And there's a nightingale chapter actually in the book. But, uh, but you know, this robin singing next to the, to the light was, uh, was something that caught my uh, attention. Uh, it was also freezing cold. And so, you know, you wonder, you know, if your gonads are not uh, developed, what makes you sing at that point of the year? Um, and so we know that birds like starlings, you know, actually generate testosterone in the brain rather than uh, um, in their testes, for instance. Uh, um, so we, we, we do have these uh, winter singing birds, but this one was also singing at night, uh, which was an extra complication. So, so that brings up another issue. You or already commented that birds can tell the time of day but also what you were just saying, they also can tell the season. So, and, and that elicits some behavior, some will fly south in the winter. Well, how do they sense the change in the season? So, go ahead. Well, um, so getting back to those clocks within the brain, it isn't entirely clear, as I said, why an animal should need a clock, given the fact that we live in an in a, in a extremely predictable rhythmic environment. The world itself really presents a pretty good timepiece. The original, um, idea for why these clocks exist was not actually to explain daily rhythms and behavior. The, the original hypothesis, named after uh, Erwin Buning, called the Buning Hypothesis, was actually um, designed to explain seasonality, particularly in flowers, but it also counts for, for photoperiodic animals. So an, an animal may, may hibernate in the winter and have to prepare for that. And one of the main cues for when, it, when winter is coming is day length. If the days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and that animal can measure time, um, it can prepare for these radically different seasons. Um, and so the idea is, uh, in order to, to actually measure day length and keep track of day length, one needs a clock. And so the original idea for what these, why these clocks are adaptive in an evolutionary sense was it gave the animal, uh, the plant, the ability to measure time, to measure day length, and reckon whether uh, summer or winter uh, is coming. 
Now, both these birds, Mark, you made the point, the owl is found on virtually every continent but Australia. This is a European robin, but obviously we have robins here in America. Do, do they behave the similarly, whether to sensing time or their singing or their behaviors, or do they, the Europeans act differently than the, the Americans like, you know, but people do? They certainly do because the American robin is not really a robin, it's a thrush, right? Uh, Turdus migratorius. So their closest relatives are, uh, are European blackbirds, song thrush, um, the red wing, which is not to be confused with the red wing blackbird. Um, and so I had a job actually in New Zealand where Europeans uh, introduced their favorite species because why should you look at native New Zealand birds when you can have a European uh, blackbird or you know a chaffinch, right? Or hedgehogs if you're a mammal person. Um, and so um, we actually compared uh, the, the breeding uh, behaviors of uh, blackbirds in Europe versus New Zealand and uh, they have fewer eggs in New Zealand. Uh, it's well known that southern hemisphere birds uh, in general have fewer eggs in the nest than northern hemisphere birds, but even an introduced species, you know, evolved over, you know, 150 generations of living in New Zealand to have fewer eggs in the clutch. And so, you know, th the birds are actually doing different things. Uh, in New Zealand, nobody preys on the adult robins or adult blackbirds because, you know, the predators are gone extinct too. Um, and, but, but there are rats. People brought rats with them and, you know, the rats eat the eggs. And so uh, what happens is uh, life history wise, the birds pay very little attention to every nest. Uh, they lay few eggs, but what happens is they live forever and so they can lay another egg, another nest and another nest and another nest full of eggs. And so um, they, they change their life history, they change their investment into a clutch of eggs based on you know, whether that nest is gonna be surviving or not. So depending where these birds are, they are doing very different things and introductions are sort of um, nature's um, perverse experiments or uh, humanity's perverse experiments, to be honest, uh, uh, to see um, you know, what happens when you translocate a species to another continent. All right, and I think we have one more example. Oh yeah, so this is the, the, the cover of uh, the book, a, an original of a picture I can't afford because the wonderful illustrator Tony Engal is selling it for so much, um, but if you have the funds, please buy it from him. Um, I, uh, I, I have the minor uh, um, chapter at home. I just arrived the other day. Uh, so, so I, w I, you know, this is this is you know a classic image. I wanted to write about uh, the secretary bird, which is an African uh, um, hawk species, because it kicks snakes to death. And you know that alone, it's a current biology paper by Steve Portugal and his collaborators, but that alone is, is worth a chapter, if not a whole book, uh, if not a whole New York Times article. Um, and, uh, and, and so you know, we were actually able to afford to, to, to paint uh, uh, the, 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 um, the eyeing of the, the secretary bird uh, um, orange on the cover of the book. And so if you see it, you know, it, it actually comes in three colors. But, uh, but this bird also brings up some conservation concerns. So this is an African savanna species. And it's getting so hot through global change, even in the savanna, that the breeding success of the birds is going down. The chicks are not able to make it. Uh, they are literally boiling to death. You know, they're, they, are, they are dehydrated at the nest. Uh, and so even in the, some of the hottest uh, uh, you know, habitats in the world, global change is causing uh, the birds to, uh, to have depressed reproductive success. And so that's the other angle that, uh, that I cover in the book. So, so these three birds are active in di different times of the day. How, is, do you have any thoughts about why this bird is active? I think it's a daytime bird. The, the owl is a much more of an evening bird. Is it, you know, it's like a chicken or egg problem, but you know, to forgive the pun. Um, why does a bird you know, go into that niche in the day? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, with the with the secretary bird, you know they are they are snake specialists, right? And so you know the snakes are out in the middle of the day, you know when heat is at there, and uh, and so they can, uh, you know they are they are poikilothermic, so they, they they need the heat to be able to move around, and so the bird is active uh, during that part of the t the day. Uh, in fact, it was actually kind of hard to find species that did something interesting in the middle of the day, because if you're a birder, you know you go out at 5 a.m. and there's morning chorus or dawn chorus. 
Uh, you go out at night and all the dust birds are coming out and then you're out there at 10 and really nothing is happening. And so, you know, um, um, some people who actually, you know, read through the book, they were like, well, why is Mark talking about a duck sleeping in the middle of the day? Um, because, you know, that's what they do. They, they sort of take a nap and then, you know, they become active again in the afternoon. Uh, um, the, the, the robin is, is sort of the, the outlier in the sense that it's a daytime bird, except it also sings into the night when there's artificial illumination. And then, you know, the owl is a, is a mammalian predator, right? And most mammals, most rodents are nocturnal, uh, which makes them, you know, not so great as a model for studying human behavior because they're diurnal. At the same time, you know, they're mammals, so their genome is more similar to ours. Uh, um, and that's my, you know, biomedical uh, um, argument for why we should study birds. Um, but, uh, but, you know, if you're a mammalian predator, you need to be active at night. And when um, birds are active at the, the this different time of day, you said, you know, the, the, the duck was sleeping during the day. Do all, you know, I, I would like to take a nap during the day. Um, do all the birds take naps or do some just active, active, then go to sleep? And what uh, determines uh, that? You know, if again, if you're a birder, you know a lot of birds are just, you know, sort of taking, uh, 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 taking it easy. Uh, uh, you know, maybe the insects are not as active or other predators are out there. Um, uh, these ducks are a good example because they, they are, you know, still being preyed on in the middle of the day. So they go to sleep with half of their brain. Uh, um, you know, one of their, their eyelids is open, the other one is, uh, is closed, and so half of their brain is asleep while the other one is looking out for, for predators or bumping into neighbors or, you know, looking at potential mates and things like that. Uh, birds have this wonderful um, uh, laterality in their eye use. So they literally use one of their eyes to look for predators and they use their other eyes for sex, which on Valentine's Day is a fair thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Ori, uh, one of the things that Mark mentioned is that one of the reasons the robin was singing into the night is due to artificial illumination. So over the last probably 200 years with the, well, I guess m even last 150 years with the birth of uh, electrification, how has that uh, impacted circadian rhythms? It's, it's been a major, it's been an extremely recent and, and profound insult to the living world. So as recently as 1950, only about 50% of the households in the United States were electrified. It's only about half the households as recently as 1950 had access to electric light. Um, so, you know, ancestrally, all animals, including human beings, evolved uh, with, with a clear indication from the environment what time it was. Um, our days were very, very bright. So even, the, even a fairly bright seeming cubicle during the day is a couple log units less light than we would get even on a cloudy day outside. So we're getting a lot less light at night and we're getting a lot of light, sorry, we're getting a lot less light during the day and we're getting a lot more light at night. So, you know, cheap electric light bulbs were, are, are one thing, but the devices are another. And so basically we used to have this very, very high amplitude clock-like oscillation between a very, very bright day and a very dark night. Um, and that's been fundamentally changed uh, over larger and larger areas of the planet. And it's having a negative effect on pretty much anything with the circadian clock, uh, for sure. What are some of the consequences for birds or other organisms for the breakdown of the circadian clock? Do you want to speak to birds specifically, and I can talk more generally after? Sure. So, so changing, you know, whether or not you migrate, when you migrate, um, are are all aspects that 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 we care about. Uh, um, I was actually biking uh, um, on the West Side Highway. Uh, um, well, not on the highway, but you know, on the bike track um, the other day, and uh, you know, people were you know sort of taking pictures of something, and then I heard a mockingbird singing in the middle of February in, in New York City, which you know would have never happened, you know, uh, um, uh, decades ago, and and so you know, I stopped, of course, and was listening to the mockingbird for a while, but uh, but uh, uh, you know, in Europe, there's really clear examples of 
um, uh, things starting to migrate, you know, whether, it, you know, and, and we know that migration is driven by light cycles, not necessarily by temperature. Um, uh, and so short distance migrants are more amenable to change their, their, their migratory behavior, which, um, you know, if you read the book, you know that I love brood parasites like common cuckoos, which are long distance migrants. And so when the cuckoos come back, by, by that time, the short distance migrants have already started breeding. And so the cuckoos don't have a nest to lay their eggs in. Um, and so, you know, you have further decline of long distance migrants because of this mismatch between migratory time, times. Uh, and speaking more generally, so a fundamental um, feature or a characteristic of a circadian, so the word circadian comes from a, about a day. It means almost a day. And so a defining feature is if, if, you, if you look at, say, uh, perch hopping rhythms of a bird and you bring that bird into the lab and you put that bird under constant dim light, so there's no, there's no temporal cue, there's no lights on, lights off to tell the bird what time it is, it will continue to have a daily rhythm in its perch hopping rhythm, a very clear rhythm. There's clearly a day for that bird when they're hopping on the perch and a night when it's, when it's sleeping. But if you look at the actual timing of that rhythm without the cues from the environment, it's slightly different than 24 hours. So many birds have uh, circadian rhythms that run, say, at 23 and a half hours per day, per internal day, instead of 24.0 hours of the solar day. And so what that means is that if you have a circadian clock that is precise but inaccurate, it runs too fast or too slow, we rely on light to reset those clocks. And light is the most potent way to reset those clocks. Um, and so this is, this is really working havoc on our, on our schedules, something we call chronotype. You mentioned chrono, your chronotype and your graduate student's chronotype in the book. Uh, so when we like to get up uh, in the morning and when we like to go to bed, as it turns out, we're all becoming later and later and later types as the years pass. And that's because our light environment is getting really bad at telling our clocks what time it is. And so all of these, all of these interesting rhythms, so the secretary bird knowing when to go out and kick, the, kick those snakes to death, um, that, that's a product of the circadian clock telling it to get ready to do that. Well, that rhythm is not going to be what we call entrained as well if that bird is, uh, is exposed to artificial light at night, and that's gonna ch fundamentally change its daily timing and, and possibly do so to the detriment of that, of that species. Yeah, we see in humans that you know, people that are night owls or morning people, and so there's variety within an individual species. Is there a variety like that within birds, or is that something unique to humans? I don't know that, you know, as a scientist, you have to say, I don't know when you don't know um, or when nobody knows. Um, and so, you know, I think if you have, you know, like pets, you know that they adapt to some of your, your timetables. Um, and so, you know, if you were comparing, you know, a, a cockatiel in somebody who is a morning person versus somebody who is a, uh, a night person, you know, they probably have a different rhythm. So, so I would, I would think it's out there, but, uh, you know, I have a chapter on, on the dawn chorus and, and it's important for everybody to participate in the dawn chorus because the females are listening. And so, you know, if you're a male and you're not participating in the dawn chorus, you're gonna miss out on some opportunities. Um, it's also the time when, when, you know, there's perhaps less environmental noise, you know, through wind or through, you know, other animals uh, are working in the, or, or, you know, vocalizing in the habitat. So, you know, I think that sometimes are important. Uh, cowbirds actually make make uh, use of uh, of the consistency of their hosts laying their eggs maybe ten minutes after sunrise, and the cowbird comes in about five to ten minutes before sunrise. And it's important for the cowbird to sneak in her egg before the host does, because if the host sees the cowbird, she will abandon the nest or beat up the cowbird. And so, you know, those cowbirds have to have, you know, a very precise timing. Uh, um, it also tells you that the cowbird has to remember from the previous day where the nest is because it's pitch dark when she's coming to find it, or uh, it's pitch dark when she's flying into the forest and looking for a nest. Uh, so in fact, female cowbirds have large hippocampal volumes, which is the brain area responsible for uh, spatial memory. Um, and, uh, and so the timing of the egg laying and the spatial memory work uh, um, hand in hand. 
So you, you mentioned this, uh, this question of whether this, this, this chronotype issue is, uh, holds for, for animals as well as human beings. And the, the, human, the human system uh, is actually quite instructive here. So the vast majority of us have uh, a chronotype, a timing, that actually does not fit anymore with school and work times. The majority of us do not have a clock that allows us to get, the, say, the eight hours of sleep that we need every night to be up by school and, um, and work start times. So as I said, human chronotypes are getting later and later and later, and that corresponds with spending less and less time outside, more and more time inside under artificial light. Well, uh, Kenneth Wright um, uh, did a wonderful study with human beings where he looked at human beings in a city, and they had the full range of human chronotypes. There were early types and middle types and late types. And when he, so then he did the experiment and he took them all camping for a week. And lo and behold, when they were living uh, without electric light, they all became early types. So really early types is our ancestral way of timing things. And if we give ourselves an ancestral light uh, environment, we, we become early types. And so I think my, the best guess is based on the human data is, are these bird populations that are exposed to, to strange light environments might very well uh, uh, display a, a wider range of chronotypes like humans do. You, you, in explaining the situation with the cowbird mark, you talked about you know a brain specialization. Are there other specializations for birds that are more nocturnal versus birds that are more active during the day? Definitely. So obviously, eye size is going to be relevant. You know, most birds can just hear their way through the environment. They have to see a little bit. Um, you know, migratory birds have larger eyes than the non-migratory birds. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, uh, some birds are, are olfactory driven. So I've got a chapter about the kiwis, which have the nostrils at the tip of their, uh, um, their tip of their, uh, their beaks to be able to probe the ground and sniff for earthworms. And so their olfactory bulb is much larger than, for instance, uh, um, a, a chickadee's olfactory bulb. The funny thing is that the chickadee rel relatives, such as blue tits in Europe, are still using their olfactory system. So, you know, we, we think of, uh, you know, brain area as uh, sort of an indicator of functionality, but even a tiny little bit of a brain area can still do a lot of function. And so if you walk away with nothing but knowing that birds can, sn can smell uh, from this lecture, I've done my job. Um, uh, but uh, but they you know there are obviously you know hearing specialists uh, song centers so you know we know it from Canary from Fernando Nottenbaum's work at Rockefeller University and a lot of other people uh, working so so canaries and other seasonal singers uh, grow their brain areas that are responsible for singing the HVC for instance uh, actually you know. Michael is a specialist now, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he's at NYU uh, uh, sitting in the front row here. So these brain areas, you know, are responsible for singing. And when the bird is practicing its next uh, season songs, you know, the, the neurons are forming all kinds of connections. And when the song sets, uh, the brain area shrinks a little bit uh, to save some energy. Brain is expensive uh, energetically and, uh, and, you know, singing is expensive energetically. And, uh, and so, you know, these, these areas uh, that have to do with acoustics, with vision, with olfaction, uh, uh, with, with, with hearing uh, are all important for birds. All right. I'm one other question about uh, birds and training to the time is what happens when things go awry? There's been examples of natural experiments. A, a few years ago, there were some massive earthquakes, uh, excuse me, volcanoes in Iceland, which created a, a gray plume across Europe, which undoubtedly affected some sort of, you know, the light coming in and affected the weather. Did that affect the behavior of birds or other animals? So I was in Illinois uh, in 2017 when the, the solar eclipse was happening. You guys didn't quite get the full effect here, but we drove four hours to southern Illinois, which is still the same state. And, uh, and uh, the solar eclipse was complete. You haven't dri driven to Buffalo. We can do nine hours and stay <laughs> that's in That's true. That's true. I have driven, and it was a snowstorm, and, you know, the the PTSD has set in. Um, but, uh, but there I was, you know, total eclipse, you know, and the starlings went to roost and the nighthawks came out at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you know, so it, it wasn't terrible because the solar eclipse lasted, uh, you know, two minutes and then the, the nighthawks all went back, uh, you know, to roost on the, ro on the building tops. Uh, uh, but, but you can see how, you know, the light 
uh, uh, cues were so important, uh, overriding some of the other, uh, you know, in, in internal clocks. At, the, at you know, in this particular case. But I think I think you know, light pollution is uh, is definitely uh, you know a, a major factor, and then you know how it interacts with the migratory times, uh, and you know. This uh, disconnects with uh, with temperature regimes, for instance, uh, uh, could be uh, could be uh, um, a major cause of mortality. Are there any examples? You know, you made the point. You know, the the barn owl is a nocturnal animal because that's when its food is there. The, the 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 small rodents it preys on. Is there anything from the the prey's perspective? Well, they know that the barn owl is coming out, so they were going to adapt their lifestyle to avoid the predator. So so there's a chapter on Cook's petrels, which is, you know, this small little petrel. Um, and uh, until I worked with a larger petrel, I wasn't quite aware why, you know, what's going on. And so the Cook's petrels are a gentle petrel. Um, you can touch them and they bite you and they don't cut off your finger, which is important for field work. Um, but they are being preyed on by larger seabirds. Uh, and so uh, they actually end up using, uh, you know, they, they are active during the day. They are out there at the sea foraging, but they come to land only on the darkness because they want to avoid the larger seabirds picking them up or the, the, the hawks and the, and the eagles picking them off, um, you know, because they have, are terrible on, on land. They crash through the trees and they, you know, they can barely walk and then sniff their way to their nest, but they do it only at night uh, because they are so vulnerable to predation. So even a bird prey itself is is going to change its uh, its uh, its behavior uh, uh, when it's unable to run away or take flight. Uh, um, imagine that you're in a in a mature forest in New Zealand, and uh, you crash uh, you crash through the the canopy to land on the ground. You actually have to climb back onto the trees to be able to take off flight again. Uh, but you know you typically live on an island with no rats and no mammalian predators, and so you know uh, it's the other avian predators you're trying to escape. And how about uh, other animals? Is or do you have any thoughts on that? Do other animals intentionally change their circadian rhythms to give themselves an evolutionary advantage? Um, absolutely. So you know the 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 clock is a is a, is an amazingly uh, powerful orchestrator of our lives, but uh, all animals and 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 most organisms will throw that out when necessary. Um, so, for example, um, if you haven't had enough to eat, so if you um, are starving uh, in the wild, uh, you will throw out that sleep wake cycle in order to find food. Um, in addition, you know you do find you f you do find uh, that, that that many animals are able to switch their temporal niche if to take advantage of opportunities. So if food is only available um, at a specific time of the day during which you do not normally eat, you will the animal will very rapidly employ their clock to anticipate that new reality uh, to get that food when it's there. So it's clear that the system is um, is very accurate and it, it continues to tick, but there's a really beautiful plasticity there that allows animals and plants to take advantage of that internal temporal order to change their behavior when, when it's opportune. So if, for instance, you want to watch kiwis in New Zealand, you go to Stewart Island because uh, on Stewart Island there's not enough food for the kiwis, and so they forage all day long as well as all night long. If you go to Tiri Tiri Matangi Island, which is on the north of New Zealand, they forage at night because you know the earthworms are everywhere. Um, actually, introduced earthworms too, and so it's you know the Stewart Island kiwis are famous for being you know sort of crepuscular and even daytime kiwis. Um, and so, uh, so you know that that kind of shift from a, a purely nocturnal organism to you know a daytime or crepuscular organism is 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 eminently feasible. Now you might ask the question: What preys on a kiwi? Why is it a nocturnal species? Remember, New Zealand used to have these giant eagles that preyed on moas and other giant birds. Um, unfortunately, neither the moas or the giant eagles, the half eagles, exist anymore. But the kiwis are still maintaining their nocturnal schedule. You, one of the things, of course, one of the most common things that uh, birds eat are, are insects, and you know they, they fly as well. And and or you you study an insect model, uh, Drosophila melagaster, which most of us think of as a nuisance, the the fruit fly. But I think you have a little different perspective on that. 
Yeah, so the, the only reason we un understand uh, the molecular basis of a bird's clock is because we discovered, not me, but we as a field, uh, discovered a molecular clockwork in the fruit fly. Um, so these were based on uh, simple genetic screens for mutant flies that had a messed up clock. That led to the discovery of a very small number of genes, and uh, versions of those genes are ticking away right now in the hypothalamus of your brain and in the hypothalami and pineal glands of birds all over the world. So the fly was really a unique opportunity to discover the genes that make up our clock. And uh, luckily for the three Nobel laureates in 2017 working in the fly, um, those genes are highly conserved. So we have a version or multiple versions of each of those fly clock genes that uh, time our behavior and physiology as well. So the fly's been very good to us. So the mechanisms that govern our entrainment to, to, to light are very similar, whether we're talking about flies, we're talking about birds, or we're talking about mammalians? Actually, it's actually birds, birds and, and flies and birds and bees are much more alike than, than, than birds and mammals. So we are all descendants of nocturnal uh, mammals. So there was this, uh, what we call the nocturnal bottleneck, that all existing mammals evolved from nocturnal mammals. And so that makes us very different in some, some important ways from birds. Um, so for example, uh, we, uh, m m uh, mammals have a pineal gland that makes melatonin, that's a, that's a hormone of the night, of darkness, and, and birds have a pineal gland. It's very, very important for their uh, daily circadian rhythms. But the, the, the bird's pineal gland is actually directly sensitive to light. The bird actually allows enough light into its brain so that the clocks inside of its brain have access to environmental light directly. So they, they, they get their information about light both from their eyes and from deep brain photoreceptors, so neurons within the brain that are receptive to light. Because we went through a nocturnal bottleneck as mammals, we lost all of the extraocular, all the non-eye light input we lost. So we as mammals rely completely on the retina to know what time it is outside uh, with regard to light. So there's a real fundamental difference between birds and mammals that way, and the birds are very fascinating in that they let the light into the brain, uh, and we don't. What, what happens in blinded individuals, whether humans, or I know there's some certain blinded uh, amphibian and fish species? Yes, yeah, so the amphibians undoubtedly do just fine without their eyes, because they have these other photoreceptors like birds do. Uh, the, the mammalian case is really interesting. So there are forms of human blindness where you lose all of the rods and cones, the primary photoreceptors for the eye. Surprisingly, you can be completely blind due to the loss of those rods and cones, but still your clock is able, in, a, in an eye-dependent way, to know what time it is outside based on the light. And that's because, so everything your brain knows about what your eye sees uh, are relayed by a very specific kind of neuron called a retinal ganglion cell. And as it turns out, uh, a very tiny proportion of those are actually photoreceptors themselves. This was a huge surprise, a really fundamental shift in our understanding of the eye. So if you lack all retinal tissue, then you, f what we call free run. You show that non 24 hour, you come in and out of phase with the world. If you have the retinal ganglion cells, even though you don't have rods and cones, you can still uh, synchronize your clock pretty well. Ponder that for a second. <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that, you know, we read more and more about is the idea that we're going to explore space. And this is a far out question, but we're going to now maybe colonize the moon or sometime down the road colonize Mars, which is going to have a different hour day. I don't know what they are on, the, on those planets. How is that going to impact our, the circadian rhythms of the individuals living in those situations? Well, it's, a, it's really interesting. So the initial experiments that tried to allow the human clock to, to free run, in other words, to run without the influence of the environment, this, the, this took place, this was work by Jürgen Aschoff in the index bunkers in Germany. And so they put German undergraduates down in these World War II era bunkers and uh, tracked their sleep-wake cycles. And those students ended up showing days that were about 25 and a half hours long. That's closer to a day on Mars, which is around 26. Um, now, as it turns out, we know that the human clock is not quite that slow. Um, th this was a product of both the, the slow clock and the, the student's use of the lights. But the fact of the matter is we'd be fine on Mars. Our, our clock, we know, can entrain to a 26-hour day. 
that's not too far. So the, the, the clock is, because of its sensitivity to light and other cues, you can push it to 23, 25, 26, but there are limits. So it will depend completely on what that planet's periodicity is and whether or not our, our clock can grab onto that cycle. I mean, we've all experienced jet lag when we go from place A to place B. Birds, as you mentioned before, Mark, go for very long migratory journals. Do they experience something similar, or are, are they immune to jet lag? You asked the second question, to which my answer is I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, <laughs> we didn't do this ahead a, of time. A, a bird, you know, like imagine you're leaving from Alaska, right? Uh, you're at Bartel Godwit, and you're flying straight to New Zealand in seven days, no stopping, right? And you go from, you know, the end of the summer to the, you know, end of uh, uh, the the spring in New Zealand, um, you know, and the the time period is 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 different. Uh, I, th I th you know, you have to fly through because Bartel Godwits are not landing on the ocean and, you know, refueling or anything like that. They fly direct. Uh, and so you end up in New Zealand, but then, you know, you're starving. You don't have a kidney left. You don't have a, um, barely any liver left. You know, like you've, you've metabolized all your muscles except for the flight muscles. And so all you have to do is just eat all day long and all night long. And that's exactly what Bartel Godwits do when they land in New Zealand. They just consume as much food as possible at daytime and nighttime. Truly amazing. So now I want to open up to a few questions from the audience. Jimmy is somewhere. Did I surprise Jimmy? Oh, here it is uh, with the microphone. And I, if you, please wait uh, until you're holding the mic because we want to make sure our audience on Zoom uh, can hear your question as well. Uh, here and then... Hi. I think we're all familiar with the fact that uh, just before an earthquake event, you start hearing dogs barking, maybe cows mooing. Uh, does something similar happen with birds? Are they aware of things that are happening underground? Uh, we, we think that birds can, s that can hear probably infrasound. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think if there's, there's vibratory, you know, signals, they could probably pick some of that up. Uh, um, you know, my ad own PhD advisor worked on uh, celestial navigation and migratory birds, but we know that polarized light matters, you know, sound uh, um, matters, of course, memory of, of um, uh, geographic features matters, olfaction matters in pigeons in Italy, but not in Ithaca, New York, uh, don't ask me why. Um, and so, so I, I think, you know, that, that there is definitely cues that the birds can pick up um, you know, along the way, and so you see, I think the images I'm thinking about is large flocks of birds taking off as, you know, um, um, some geographic or, or geologic event is happening. Right in front there, and then we'll go to the other side. Do we know how much birds learn from each other or from their parents versus instinctual behavior? Very much. So song behavior is almost, uh, um, you know, um, a wonderful model system for human speech. Birds imitate their tutors. They also invent a little bit, but uh, but you know, hearing a father, hearing a sibling, hearing a neighbor is important both for males who you know in zebra finches, for instance, are the singing sex, and females who make those choices based on the male songs. Uh, um, um, can our, our, our cardinals, you know, learn differently from their tutors uh, if they are females compared to when they are males? Um, birds can learn about the identity of cuckoos and the color of cuckoo morphs from their neighbors. Um, so birds learn a lot uh, socially. In fact, social learning and, and socially mediated learning is the next hottest thing in, in, in bird research. Uh, um, so, so we are, you know, um, my, my PhD advisor, uh, one of my PhD advisors, Steve Allen, used to say, you know, assume that birds know everything that you know as a scientist, and that should be the beginning of your investigation. And so I, I really live by that because, you know, we often say, oh, you know, birds invented something or birds were able to open the, you know, the, the, um, the trash cans in New Zealand or, you know, in Sydney. And, uh, you know, those are just natural things that, that, 
you know, the birds apply to artificial stimuli. They are opening, you know, strange nuts and fruits, you know, that have hard coverings. Uh, uh, it's not surprising that, you know, they can also open things that, you know, are, are made of plastic. And so, so you know, they are terribly inventive, but they're also terribly imitative. And so, so the answer is definitely yes. Uh, two parts to my question. Uh, you mentioned that obviously light is a way that really sort of messes up the, the or circadian rhythms. Uh, I know that sound is also in the modern world is a huge factor with industrial noise. Maybe could you comment on how sound is being understood as sort of disrupting our world is in addition to the light changes. The second part of my question is, uh, I know, uh, Mark, you've talked a, a lot about some of the, the architecture of how bu tall buildings are really difficult for birds to navigate with, and even the World Trade Center has a huge number of birds that fly into it and are killed on a daily basis. Uh, can you give advice to any of the architects in the room as to, to things we could do to mitigate those behaviors? Um, so, so a couple of things, um, and, and you know, I'll, I'll also yield to Ori. Um, so noise is, of course, an, an incredible uh, aspect of our environment. And uh, we know that birds that live near uh, streams sing at different tunes than birds that don't live near streams, um, waterfalls. Um, and of course, urban noise. You know, there's a really famous uh, early 2000 paper on uh, um, um, great tits, which are chickadee relatives in Europe, uh, singing at a higher pitch in Amsterdam than in rural Netherlands, if there's such a thing as the rural Netherlands. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they, they elevated their songs about half a kilohertz or something like that. Uh, um, you know, how do you make this into an experiment? Well, you wait for a pandemic. And so there's a famous science paper from the San Francisco region to show that you know when people stop driving on the streets and public transportation stopped functioning, the birds were singing at lower pitch because the urban noise was not drowning out their songs. Uh, uh, my favorite example, and I just thought about it, uh, uh, is uh, Tempelhof, uh, uh, not Tempelhof, uh, um, Tegel Airport in Berlin. Um, so people collected data on the airport, you know, near the airport and far away from the airport, and published it in a in a second level journal uh, uh, that the birds near the airport sang at, uh, at different times of the day when the, air, the planes weren't flying. Uh, um, now, Tegel Airport was shut down uh, in favor of a terrible airport uh, in the south of Berlin. Um, and the birds are now singing all day long, and they are singing at lower pitch. And that paper made it into the bigger journal because you know this was a quasi experiment. Uh, um, regarding the architecture, you know we now obviously you know have a, a bird safe window requirement in New York City, and uh, and it's you know it's it's a lot of. Um, barring on the windows that uh, that need to be done but i think the most important thing is turning up the light at night um you know so so you know your office should should you know when you leave the office the light should automatically turn off after 20 minutes of no movement or something like that and then the birds will not be flying towards the buildings as well uh, in terms of environmental sound it's not it you can use sound to entrain a circadian clock if there's no other cues around but the the circadian system in a in an environment that has light and temperature changes wouldn't be too uh, influenced by the increase in sound but it's certainly conspiring a lot of sound at night is certainly further uh, deteriorating our sleep so one of the main problems with clocks in a modern world is we're not able to sleep as long as we need to 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 be up for the social clock the next day. So that plus noise at night is certainly not a good combination for the quality and duration of our sleep. Um, I had a question about um, kind of like the IQ of birds. Is there some birds that are smarter, a lot smarter, significantly smarter than others? And how do they show that? Yeah. So. I have a colleague who, uh, um, so everybody studies corvids, right, for intelligence, you know, crows and magpies, um, and of course parrots, you know, kias in New Zealand are famous, uh, uh, um, you know, um, cockatoos in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Sydney are famous. And so I have a friend who studied uh, um, uh, grackles, because grackles do kind of the same things as corvids do, they prey on nests and nestlings, you know, they, they look like corvids, they take up the niche of a corvid, perhaps. Grackles are not smart. 
you know, this was an entirely failed research uh, uh, a program. You know, they just can't solve anything. Uh, you know, you give them the string test, they can pull it up. You give them, you know, some sort of a puzzle, they can solve it. I felt terrible. You know, I, I really wanted grackles to be both, you know, habitat-wise and cognitively converted to the corvids, but they are not. Um, what are smart are, are starlings, for instance. And so the miners that I mentioned earlier are invasive species on every continent from, you know, from the, the Pacific to New Zealand to, um, to Hawaii to Nadia and Florida. Um, um, and, uh, and we had a grant to study them uh, out there and in Israel. And so the birds that are at the, the front of the invasion front are actually much faster in solving puzzle boxes than the birds uh, at the beginning of the invasion, which was the, the Tel Aviv Zoo, and you know, you don't need to figure out what happened, the cage opened and the birds flew off, uh, or compared to their native ranges in, uh, in South uh, uh, Central Asia. And, uh, and so the birds that are, are exploring new habitat are also better able to um, explore new foods, you know, they're less neophobic, uh, you can give them different colored food items and they'll, they'll pack on them, uh, uh, which makes sense. Uh, um, and so, in fact, I compared uh, um, uh, miners in, in a preliminary study and grackles, and the miners were just, you know, all over the place. They just wanted to explore everything, and the grackles were very conservative. Um, so, so, you know, there are, you, you have to pick your, your species and you have to pick the, the context. Cowbirds are very good at finding nests but they are not terribly good at spatial skills in the lab, uh, which is too bad because we wanted to study their spatial skills. Uh, uh, you know, birds are really good at, uh, at telling individuals apart uh, between their neighbors and their non-neighbors, uh, the deer enemy effect, for instance. Uh, um, you know, but, but they, are, they, are, you know, they are very good at telling colors apart. Uh, but not necessarily in a cognitive task. Uh, but they can tell, you know, a brighter, you know, fruit item or a brighter flower apart from a, a, a duller one or a less uh, ripe fruit item, for instance. Uh, um, so you have to pick the context in which you're asking the question. Uh, um, you know, jack of all trades is, you know, is probably going to be a, some sort of a corvid winning out. Uh, uh, um, we know that New Caledonian crows are great at tool making. Hawaiian crows uh, were probably tool makers uh, when there were lots of them uh, still flying around. So, uh, you know, um, corvids and, and cetaceans, so parrots are, are probably out there. We used to have a chicken that played tic tac toe in Manhattan. <laughs> and obviously, Flacco, I don't who know, makes it. In no one else remembers that down in Chinatown. There was a, yeah, remember the tic tac toe chicken? Sorry. Uh, question, oh, right in the back, and then we'll move forward. Hi. Um, you talked about how temperature and light tell us what, you know, what time it is internally. Is there any evidence of um, other organisms sort of informing our clocks, mm. like the way birds maybe wake us up in the morning? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's um, the, 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 the morning crow, you know, cock of the crow is the classic. And I think that um, it, I think that uh, the this, the bird song in the morning is such a visceral, beautiful indication that it's time to wake up. I mean, you can't think of a better way to wake up than that. And and as you point out, it does seem to be a morning gig. It goes away pretty soon uh, after dawn. Um, so I I think we've relied on cues like that for a very long time. Uh, well, I don't know about other animals. What do you think of other animals? Yeah, um, I. It, I'm trying to think of uh, anyone being woken up by another species. Uh, you know, um, I don't know. Um, how, uh, sure, that's right. So, so you know, uh, howling monkeys are howling monkeys are are, are great uh, because anytime they go to the bathroom, they vocalize. And so, uh, um, I actually had my my PhD advisor's son was a famous uh, researcher, Doug Emlin. Uh, who studied horn beetles, and so he needed to collect high quality poo for his research uh, because the horn beetle the, the horn beetles uh, grow a longer horn when they eat high quality poo um, and the, the howler monkeys uh, you know were his source and so he would be ready every morning the howler monkeys did their thing uh, to run out and collect uh, um, um, poo uh, from uh, this Panamanian island, and it turns out it's a valuable resource because if he was too slow, the other dung beetles would have already taken everything away. Um, so, you know, the tropics, everything is a competition. 
right here along the aisle, Jimmy. Uh, uh, you mentioned that some birds have a part of the brain that can detect light. And I don't, just don't understand how the light gets to it that it can detect it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really fascinating. Uh, and this is true of most insects as well. Um, yeah, so a, a bit, enough of that light will get through the feathers and the skull. Um, so there's re some really famous um, work by Mike Meneker, who was, was investigating fly, uh, sorry, I'm a fly guy, bird entrainment. So how the bird could, it, could, could latch on to light dark cycles. And what, what was interesting is when um, they reduced the, the intensity of the light. So you have 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness, and you're seeing whether that, that uh, bird can, can latch on to that cue and entrain to that 24-hour day. Well, when they dimmed the light enough, the bird could no longer uh, entrain. And all Mike had to do was pluck a few feathers out of the top of the head above the pineal, and all of a sudden the bird's brain could, could detect that light again, indicating that it was just, there's just enough light getting through on a bright day. Now, a, a bright day, even a fairly dim day outside, is, that's a lot of photons. And some of them are going to get through the skull and into the brain. And the bird, as opposed to our skull, which is basically solid, the bird's skull is much more like a honeycomb. Um, that's more for weight reasons, so it could fly, but so it's, it's much more translucent. Yeah, I was going to say that. So birds have two things. One is uh, they have feather tracks, so not every piece of skin is covered with feather. And so if you blow on the head of the bird, you can actually see this honeycomb brain structure that made of two layers of thin uh, but structurally sturdy components. And so and as the birds grow older, you know, the second layer ossifies. And you can actually tell whether a bird is one is uh, uh, the same year as, uh, as you catch it in the fall versus uh, an older bird by blowing on the head and figuring out if, the, if, uh, if there's ossification in the skull. And so that, you know, um, bird benders figure out, you know, if somebody is a, a, a young bird or not based on that. All the way in the back, Jimmy. Hi. <clears throat> um, I teach industrial design at Pratt Institute. And every year in the fall, I t the sophomores are supposed to study birds and do a birdhouse for them. And this year, the students said they didn't want to do that. They wanted to look, study what birds may, how birds made their nests. And I said, OK, let's see if we can learn anything from the birds. So we started looking how birds create their nests, and we all think they're all the same. But uh, it seems to me like we learned how to weave from birds. And there's the tailor bird who actually uh, sews we leaves together. And then there are birds in many parts of the world where they make adobe houses. So uh, do you think we're, we actually learned how to do those things from birds? They're I, probably doing it longer than we have. I I hope so. You know, I mean, an oven bird or the ornero in uh, in Argentina, you know, builds this wonderful structure that actually is pitch dark in the middle, and so we use that bird to to ask questions. How do you tell a cowbird apart, cowbird egg apart when you live in an entirely pitch dark house? And the answer is shape. You know, look at size and shape and tactile sensation. Um, but we also found uh, so so I have a new gig on writing about nests now because the nests of most of the ten thousand bird species have been described, uh, um, and the databases are out there, and so you can ask comparative questions about you know like let's compare 6,000 birds doing this to 4,000 birds doing that. Um, and so we know that the eyes of the birds that are weavers amongst the weaver finches, for instance, are larger compared to the more simple nest building ones. So there's nice coevolution between the sensory organs and probably the beak structure, as well as the ability to weave really delicately. I have one tiny more question. Sure. Um, I, I think I read this on Instagram, but... Um, uh, I always thought that flowers opened up in the morning because of sunlight, but apparently the studies say it's from birds singing in the morning. Do you know anything? Can you comment on this? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so uh, it really depends from species to species. And so, you know, the, the flowers come from such a diverse array of, of plants that plants have very different approaches to this. So we really, argu arguably, the field of chronobiology, the study of biological time, started with plants. 
and so it was a, it was a, a it was the realization that plants undergo these leaf movements. They were actually called sleep movements at the time, that they kind of droop down at night and they're, they, they kind of stand at attention during the day, and that flowers open and close uh, at specific times. And so for some plants, that's strictly a rhythm. It's, it's a rhythm uh, driven by an internal clock. Others are responding directly to, to the sunlight. Um, and others it's some combination of the two. And it would not surprise me at all if some species of flowers have found uh, different cues to open up at the appropriate time. Um, so Carl, Carl Linnaeus, how do you say it, Linnaeus? Linnaeus? He actually invented something called the flower clock. So he, you, could, you, can have, there's a, you can find a species of flower that opens at a specific hour of the day, much like the birds that Mark wrote about. And so he had envisioned a, a garden that you could, a circular garden that you could plant. So you could look at it and see which flowers were were open and, and, and thereby de detect what time it was. Unfortunately, they don't all flower in the same season, so it never would have worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there was a special article of behavior ecology, which is typically about animals, um, about um, auditory perception in, in plants. And so it's not that far of the deep end, for sure. Up here, uh, right. Can you describe some of the methods that you used to derive your information and reach your conclusions in writing your book? Sure thing. So, um, you know, for the birds that I studied, you know, I sort of wrote a bunch of papers on them and, uh, and uh, I tried to summarize the information. The birds I didn't study, like the secretary bird. Um, I went to um, the original literature, so, you know, primary literature like current biology that had a, a really nice cover article about, uh, about uh, um, the secretary bird's uh, kinematics of kicking. Um, and so, so I always try, even in the egg book, that was like 600 species, I, I try to get, you know, uh, two sources of peer-reviewed literature piece that I end up writing a story about um, so that we can, you know, go back to, uh, um, you know, the scientific literature to, you know, validate the, the, the stories that I end up writing. But, uh, but for the species that less is, uh, less is known, such as the night jar, you know, I, I looked at uh, um, photographs, I looked at uh, descriptions of, uh, of um, uh, uh, birding trips uh, where people have described behaviors, you know, in a, in a direct way. Uh, because, you know, some of the, the books, uh, the, some of the birds in the book, you know, weren't that well studied, uh, but I still found them fascinating. So you uh, looked at other people's works, did you? Do some of your own work to do oh, sure, an experiment. Sure. Could you could you discuss some of that? Yeah. So so the cowbirds. I you know my lab is called the Cowbird Lab, uh, and so we've published on cowbirds. You know, say 150 articles, something like that. And so you know we know when cowbirds wake up. We know when cowbirds go to sleep. We know what eggs they lay. We know how the hosts respond to the eggs. So for instance, I use 3D printed eggs to ask questions: How the robin rejects the cowbird egg? Is it shape? Is it color? Is it scent? Is it tactile stimulus? And so we've done all those experiments. You know, I, the one thing about Illinois that was not boring was the study system. You know, I worked five miles from my bed uh, uh, in a tree farm where the robins were nesting everywhere. And so we had 400 nests available to us in every single season. And so you put a 3D printed egg of a different color or a different shape into those nests and then come back the next day and ask the question, is this egg still there? Or videotape the bird's behavior. Or what my uh, student Abby Turner uh, invented is put a, a radio into the egg uh, into the fake egg and then see where the, the robin takes that egg, you know, and does that depend on the color or the shape or, uh, or her hormonal status. Uh, so we manipulated corticosterone levels uh, in these birds by, by putting jelly onto the eggs and infuse it in with corticosterone uh, uh, because we found that even though robins live with us, the moment you catch them, the moment you inject them with something, the moment you put a color band on them, they will hate you. They will despise you, uh, they will not like you ever, and they will remember you. So, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, if you have a robin nest on your, on your summer property or, you know, your vacation home, you know, you can open the door, nothing happens, the robin sits on it. 
the moment I have caught that robin and put a color band on it to be able to identify it for the future, that robin will fly away 50 yards away when, it, when, it, when she sees me. And so, you know, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to do uh, experiments that uh, disturb the birds as little as possible. And so, uh, um, you know, um, looking at hormone levels, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, indirectly uh, was a way to ask questions uh, scientifically. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is unfortunately going to be our final question. We'll, we'll go up front here, or already we have one there. Well, then, go ahead. Um, I observe birds um, in the courtyard through my window, and there is a hawk, and there are morning doves, and they are very methodical. There is a rhythm throughout the day. But I always wonder, are there any procrastinators among the birds? So I will say that robins are terrible at chronobiology uh, because I used to go out in the field, you know, at five o'clock in the morning, 5.30 sunrise, I'm done by 10 because it's super hot in Illinois. My student, Sarah, they didn't go out until noon. They were an afternoon person. And so I would say, Sarah, here's a nest with two eggs in it, and I would mark them one and two, you know, just little numbers with a felt tip pen. Sarah would get to the nest at five o'clock in the afternoon and has three eggs. And so that robin laid in the middle of the day. And in fact, you know, there's a study out there, when do robins lay? And it's unpredictable. They can lay anything from five, first thing in the morning until very early afternoon. And, you know, they just, they, I mean, the distribution is, is insanely broad. You know, the tails are super long. If you look at a, a chipping sparrow or a, a prothonotary warbler, they lay 10 minutes after sunrise, and that's it. You know, you can catch the bird by being at the nest 10 minutes after sunrise. So, so the robins are definitely procrastinators. They are weird on so many levels. I mean, I love them very much, but, uh, but they are just weird. Well, well, thank you. We, we, we love talking to you, Mark, and to you, Ori. We hope you uh, enjoyed your Valentine's Day uh, with us, and we, we hope that you spend some other evenings with us this sem semester when we really span the disciplines from Lou Reed to uh, modern economics and everything in between. So we hope you join us again in our public programs. Thank you and good night. <laughs>